Having other assets on Bitcoin, on the layer one, can mess with the consensus or can, in general can mess with the politics. All altcoins are basically obsolete because you could do it more securely and better on a Bitcoin second layer or third layer. It's very hard for me to have a bidirectional relationship. I receive money from the employer, that's it, and they pay the grocery store, that's it. I will never be paid back. So in this scenario, lining doesn't work. By design, it's not like a UX problem or it's not like an educational problem, it's really like like this is not designed for the checking account use case. Why do we need second layer solutions? There is this idea or concept we will stack, you know, seven, eight layer. But I think it's very hard because every time you go above a layer, you lose a little bit of property. So I think it would be more like common to have an onion kind of architecture, right? So we have multiple layer at the same, maybe multiple second layers, and you hop between one and the other, but you're, you try to stay closer to the base layer. If someone with some weird thing on top of Bitcoin is able to break Bitcoin, and then maybe Bitcoin was not that resilient to begin with. I like to call ARK a trustless bank. We have the base layer of Bitcoin, we have second layers around it like an onion, uh, and those second layers just serve different purposes. And in that way, we get an ecosystem that's really, really strong. If we really want to increase the monetary use case of Bitcoin, we need to make sure we can use it uh, to pay, we need to bring back commerce. Today, I really want to get into the arc and lightning and scaling solutions and how is Bitcoin above? Like we have the base layer, we know why it's so good. We know um, why we like Bitcoin for the, the properties that Bitcoin has. Um, and I think today it would be an, an amazing opportunity to talk with you about uh, scaling solutions for um, Bitcoin. But first, let's, let's uh, ask you like, what are you doing uh, at Arc uh, and also at Ven Ventures, where you are also at, and what are those companies doing? So to give some context to to you. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Robin, for having. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be to be on the pod. And uh, yeah, I mean, I started my career very early on in, the, in Bitcoin when I was 18 years old. I created a startup, uh, which was a Bitcoin brokerage service. So we were, you know, exchanging Bitcoin for cash, and we put one of the first Bitcoin ATM back then in 2013. In north of Italy, so um, we've been I've been you know working in the space in the industry for a while, but then after doing many experience, especially in the software engineering space uh, in, around the world, I decided in 2017 to go back to Bitcoin and, and focus on that. So I co-founded Whoop and Ventures, which is a, a research and development lab uh, with an investment wing. So we try to deploy our engineers to deploy capital when we can in project that we retain interesting for the Bitcoin, uh, for the Bitcoin space. And yeah, I think ARC came out of that, uh, really in the sense that many, many years spent uh, doing covenants research uh, in the last three years and deploying, um, you know, production use case uh, live in liquid, especially, gave us also this, you know, broader view in terms of like, um, how to design a new, a new product, new protocols and how that could improve Bitcoin. And yeah, I think ARC have been, you know, proposed last year and we have been like in a stealth way, um, start working on it in terms of like implementing the first prototype last, uh, in December last year, we released a video where we did the first, you know, transaction. Then we kept working in this initial, initial months, uh, but then we really and decided to go all in. And we created this spin-off company called R Clubs, which you know we are now focused 100. And the goal is really like trying to bring Arc to the world and to trying to building Arc services uh, on top. Really cool. Um, and I really like what uh, what you are doing because we really have to develop those second layers. Um, but there might be some some people in the audience uh, that maybe are newer to the Bitcoin. Uh, and, and, and they maybe don't know, like, why do we need second layer solutions? Like, why, why not just do it on Bitcoin? And why also, um, is like, like, what are second layer solutions? So maybe like really quickly, uh, just so, so people understand, like, why do we need to second layer solutions and what, what is that is an extension to Bitcoin and stuff like that? Sure. I think, and, you know, I go back also to my experience in 2013 when I was used you know, to go around and uh, orange peel people, I, for me, it was super simple back then. I, I said to them, hey, download at the time, maybe blockchain.info or whatever, like just download a simple Bitcoin wallet. You create a key pair, even just a paper, you know, paper, a paper wallet. 
And that's it. And they came to me, I can send to them even $1 uh, worth of Bitcoin. And that worked every time. Uh, this, of course, you know, going forward, Bitcoin grew. <laughs> and of course, as, you, uh, as we know, there are moments uh, where the mempool is so congested, which means that, you know, to enter in the next block, uh, it will take you maybe 100, even $100, or, you know, you need to wait uh, a lot of time to do that, which is, of course, deny the initial point of was so simple, so easy to onboard people to Bitcoin. Um, and we understood that the blockchain gives you, and the proof of work is incredible. So what Satoshi Nakamoto pull out was, was an incredible property to create censorship resistant money. But the problem is blockchain don't scale. And we need to figure out a way to make sure we can also scale. Otherwise we will uh, go to a point where it will be like the gold back, in, back then, so hard to transport and you end up with custodian uh, basically and to capture the value. So I think uh, second layer solution are ways to not compromise on the ethos of Bitcoin, to not compromise on the uh, basics of what Bitcoin should be, right? So censorship resistant money, but at the same time makes you maybe of course with some trade-off in life, there is no free lunch, right? So there is always trade-off, but um, choosing your own subset of trade-off, uh, definitely you need to have a way to make sure you can definitely use the property of Bitcoin at the base layer, also in other new use cases, which is not only maybe potentially just savings, right? Do you think that we need more than one second layer solution or will over time everything melt like in one second layer solution or like maybe in two, three? No, I totally think that uh, there will be multiple protocols and, and every protocol will have its own trade-offs. And even now we're using internet and there are a bunch of protocols we don't even know. We are just saying, yeah, I'm using the internet, but there are a bunch of protocols behind of this, UDP, TCP, and, and they can even work at the same time together or just one on top of the other. So I really think that at some point we will never talk about Lightning, Arc, or state chain, we will just say Bitcoin, right? So and eventually, you know, the application will just use a bunch of other protocol to deliver you Bitcoin the same, in the same way. So, and also again, we are speaking about money here. We're not speaking about, uh, you know, communication protocols. And to me, every time you try to stack it, so there is this idea or concept, we will stack, you know, seven, eight layer. But I think it's very hard because every time you go above a layer, you lose a little bit of property. So I think it would be more like common to have an onion kind of architecture, right? So we have multiple layer at the same, maybe multiple second layers, and you hop between one and the other, uh, but but you you try to stay closer to the base layer, which is really like the, the best, right? So Bitcoin is always the best. So closer you are, better you are in terms of uh, censorship resistant. So the idea, would would be we have the base layer of Bitcoin, we have second layers around it like an onion, uh, and those second layers just serve different purposes. Uh, and in that way, we get an ecosystem that's really, really strong. Yeah, I do, I do believe this. This will be the, the likely scenario. Oh, nice. And what is now the the use case or like the 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 need for for arc and maybe because i think most people know lightning or at least heard about lightning uh and arc is a little less known like how is the differentiation between arc and, and lightning yep i think lightning just to not go too much technical on the differences but just from a very high level uh, perspective i think lightning the the beauty of lightning has been this invention that allow you to have you know this payment channel between me and you right so me and robin we have a payment channel and we know that we transact potentially back and forth multiple time so why not do, why doing a bitcoin transaction every time we need to transact so why not we set up some funds there in this payment channel and ideally we'll never touch the blockchain unless one of us you know is trying to you know to exit or is trying to you know, to, to scam the other and, 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 and so on. And the beauty of Lightning has been, why don't go beyond just to a payment channel, but why we don't create a network. So if you, Robin, have your own friend and you have a channel and I want to pay your friend, I will use the balance we have between me and you, Robin, to, you know, to pay. So I think this is like the, the very, you know, uh, simple concept of Lightning. And one thing that uh, maybe for non-technical or people not actually working 
I th- and also, I, I mean, I don't want to go back in 2017 when there was like block, you know, the block size war, but really people try to use this use case and to say, okay, we solve scaling, right? So we think that this is the use case that fits every type of payment use case, which is not a reality because in practice, like very few times I go back and forth in a payment, for example, and I will make an example. So I introduce Arc where I think instead is more, is more fit. Imagine the classic checking account, right? So you receive a salary once per month from your employer. Then you will never pay your employer back, never, because you only receive from your employer, usually, you know, most of the time. And most of the other, the other, the funds will be spent through merchants, you know, shops around the people, or maybe paying dinner, splitting dinner with, you know, new friends or a, or a meetup. So you understand how it's very hard for me to have a bidirectional relationship. I receive money from the employer, that's it. And they pay the grocery store, that's it. I will never be paid back. So in this scenario, lining doesn't work. By design, it's not like a UX problem or it's not like an educational problem. It's really like this is not designed for the checking account use case, which for me is really just the last mile, um, you know, how people use, interact with money. They receive usually huge chunk and then they pay, they pay random peers. And lining doesn't work very well because you need to have this topology of, of channel or interconnected and you need to hope uh, there will be a route um, by then. And we see that these tend really like to centralize a lot uh, because if you want to have reliability, you need to know very well uh, this connection. Instead, Arc, I think it's um, much more different. It's much more similar to Bitcoin on chain. Like the example I, I, I said before, when in 2013 I was you know doing education early on, like. I just ask them a public key, an address, boom, I pay them. Arc is similar. There is no channel. There is no inbound liquidity, which we can, we can you know, um, go deeper later. But there is really just, hey, hey give me your address and, and I will pay you inside the Arc. And there is no need of liquidity between me, me and you, no channel, because there is an actor called the Arc service provider which this actor will make simple, is a coordinator, which makes simple uh, to create an uh, ARC uh, transaction, which we, we can go deeper uh, for sure. Yeah, maybe maybe let's go a little bit deeper here. How, because I think um, Bitcoin are usually really conscious about their Bitcoin, especially those who have their own keys and they don't want to give uh, any control of, of their keys away. And that's why like it's, it's really important to, uh, always like explain like how how does this work? Um, I mean, I'm always a little bit in in, in two hearts because I know a, a little. Bit, the more technical my podcast gets, the more people uh, step out. But but I think it's an important conversation. Uh, and, but maybe we can can uh, leave it as 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 <laughs> as easy as it gets, but still get some some depth into there. How how does how does it work? And 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 yeah, can you explain us? Yeah, absolutely. So I will start with a very simple Elify, just to get an intuition of what an ARC is. So I like to call ARC a trustless bank. I know people maybe are a bit worried about the term bank, but I think it's the best way to explain something, to use things that people really are, are already uh, understanding and intuition. So I use the term trustless, and there's also the reason why I think ARC is a second layer, because I can, in any time, without asking permission of my banker, get my money out. So the process works in a way where I take my Bitcoin on the layer one, on, on the normal Bitcoin blockchain. I go to the ARC service provider, in, the, in this case, this, this banker, and say, hey, give me a virtual uh, Bitcoin in exchange, which is really similar to depositing gold and getting a check, right? And then what I do with these checks, I can pay other people inside this bank just trading my check for a new check, right? So I will say, I will go again to the bank and I say, hey, you issued this check to me. Can you please use it to pay Robin, right? And Robin maybe never even joined the ARC yet. So he can just receive it inside the ARC without even knowing. I will just go to you, Robin, and say, hey, Robin, there is this bank. Go to the bank. There are money for you, waiting for you. So, and those are your, uh, your Bitcoin. That at any time, if the banker goes away, you can go out. And you can go to the Bitcoin blockchain and receive your actual Bitcoin in an actual UTXO, in an actual uh, spend transaction output, right? And there is a caveat, and which is very important, and is this check 
as an expiration, which means that, and you know, this is very common with check, no? Like you have an expiration that usually, if you don't go, don't, don't go to redeem this, this check from the banker uh, before the expiration, the, the sender will, will be able to reclaw, right? So this is very, you know, how check with expiration works. And I think, vir and now I, we can introduce the name virtual transaction output, right? So we really mimic what is the on-chain, the unspent transaction output, and we call it virtual. And this virtual transaction output gives you uh, this guarantee uh, that if you are at least live before the expiration, uh, you can get back your, your, your Bitcoin or get a new check with a new expiration. So you can stay inside the ARC uh, without going on chain. And you just need to go live and say to the banker, hey, I'm, I'm alive. So, okay, this is very like high level. So just to go now deeper, how it works, it works because this coordinator, the ARC service provider, what it does is basically create periodic transaction. It can happen every five seconds or it can happen once per month. This is totally arbitrary. And in this transaction, this periodic transaction, uh, you create, you basically, it's very similar to a round where all the people join and, and say, hey, I want to exchange my check for another check. And so all people gather, and then when the coordinator is done and it completed the, all the signature from everybody, will basically broadcast this uh, transaction, which is a normal Bitcoin transaction. And there is one thing called the shared output. This shared output, the shared UTXO, is basically an address very similar to a channel of, of Lightning, which is a two of two in Lightning, but here is like 1,000 to 1,000, or even 1 million to 1 million people can be aggregated all these 1 million um, pe people in, in one single Bitcoin address. So you see how is blockchain um, footprint, footprint minimal. So it really consume only one address and we can e ideally put 1 million people, one, even 1 billion people. Of course, there are like trade-offs, but just to give you a sense how this shared, shared output allow you to um, horizontally scale to a large, large number uh, much more than Lightning, where Lightning you need to have two of two, two of two, two of two. So you need to have one channel every two, um, you know, two peers. Here we can have one single shared output and bunch of, of other payment virtual Bitcoin are basically committed, uh, committed there. So, and the question is, okay, but I have this share. Let's say that this shared output is one, 10 BTC. How do I get out? How do I know that I can get my, maybe I have one BTC, right? One virtual Bitcoin uh, that is committed there, how I know I can exit. There is a condition in the script that, are, that al allow me to exit unilaterally. So there is unilateral exit at any time. And the process works where basically all these virtual transactions are basically created in a binary tree. So it's a binary tree of multiple transactions. So it means that, you know, from the 10 BTC in this shared output, which is on the blockchain, you can really bisect, which means, you know, you split five Bitcoin, five Bitcoin, then 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5. So you go like a tree, right? A binary tree. So you bisect, that's the technical term. And then you go, you make sure that then all the actual Bitcoin can go out. So it's a serious or actual real Bitcoin transaction that we just decide to never broadcast. We only keep it virtual between us and the coordinator. Interesting. Um, so you you always have the 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 chance to get it out, and you always have to the the thing like okay, I I, I want it now, and that's also how you secure it in a way where there's not the same problem happening, or hopefully not happening, which happened with gold. <laughs> Uh, when we talk about gold, because there was also the idea of scaling it with with the banknotes, and and uh, that's basically how how we how we have now the the fiat system. Um, but there's also like, do you see when when there's only a small? I had a, an episode with with Wicked uh, where we talked about UTXO management and how limited the base layer is, and his uh, thesis was like around five to ten million institutions or persons will ever be um, on the base layer uh, to transact monthly uh, to each other because at some point the, the, the 10, 11th million person will be priced out of the, of the base layer. Do you see a, an, an risk there that we are getting too dependent on, on second layers uh, or that, that, we, that there, there is something like an, an second, I mean, for some 
for some people, even an ETF is a second layer where we we could have more Bitcoin than uh, we, we actually have. Um, how, how do you see th that situation? Do, do you see any any problems there? Yeah, it's, uh, it's totally true in the sense that um, anything that you cannot afford to pay the minor fees is basically custodial. And even right now, if you have very, very few dust, it's called dust amount, basically you cannot never, you, since you cannot pay the minimum relay fee to be transacted on the main chain, basically are Bitcoin that are not are a gift to the miners to be. To be. So, um, and I think this is also true for Lightning, right? So if I want to go out of the channel and the fees are so high in that moment, and I want to broadcast the justice transaction, if the value of the channel is below, the minimum relay fee of that moment, you basically trust the other partner. And on ARC is no different in the sense that um, when we want to go out, if your virtual transaction output, your virtual Bitcoin uh, balance is below the cost of actually exercising this unroll, we call it unroll, unroll transaction, which unilateral exit you from this tree, um, you, you, you basically cannot do it. That being said, um, there are many research on, on the matter. Like, for example, if there is a very wealthy person who has another virtual Bitcoin, but is very, very wealthy, and if for him, it doesn't care to pay, I don't know, 100 bucks more to get out 1 million, it potentially will subsidize for you. Or even you can do sort of class action, right? So many, many small uh, virtual Bitcoin holder, if the, this coordinator disappear, they will be able to join forces and potentially pay pay that. Also, there is an approach called congestion control, which say to you, hey, you will get your Bitcoin, but to pay the minimum amount fee, we need to wait one year, right? So you make sure that this three is enrolled in one year. So you don't pay, you don't go with high priority fee, but you pay the minimum uh, in the mempool. And that will be a good trade-off. It, it tells you, hey, you need to wait one year, but you get, you're getting your money, your money out. So this is another approach. But that being said, from a We'll say from a philosophical perspective, I think personally, I think Bitcoin, again, uh, of course, I am working to try to onboard, you know, billion of people to Bitcoin. That's my, uh, my, my, my goal. But at the same time, I really understand that Bitcoin is not like a public good. It's not something that needs to, you know, convey everybody. And at the same time, I really see Bitcoin as a feudalism, right? So there will be people that are like, you so rich and people, which is land or castle or, you know, an army and, people would be peasants. So this is like the way it works in the world. But that and but and I see Hark in a way where maybe you cannot afford an entire like to take an example of home ownership, right? So people start when they're young, they cannot afford to buy an entire house, but they rent, right? And Hark, what gives you is really an, a, a financial model where basically you are renting People that are UTIC so rich, the service provider, the coordinator, is basically you know the equivalent of a landlord, right? Which is giving you their UTIC so, their own chain UTIC so, and they will rent you to you some virtual uh, transaction output, and he's incentivized to be live because more is live, and more he gets fees. But even if he goes away, disappear, you can get back your actual Bitcoin out of there. So I think the, the economics checks out, and it's really like a tr again, is like a landlord that is you know renting you some blockchain, you know, UTXO space since you arrived, maybe in 20 years you arrived, there would not be possibility for normal people to acquire entire UTXO. That can happen, but you can have a virtual UTXO, right? Interesting. What, what do the ARC service providers uh, get for providing a service? Yeah, here I think it's very open in terms of business model, but I mean, the, the, the simplest way to think about it is imagine uh, for, for the service provider, uh, I don't know, to have one BTC locked in a shared output, it will cost maybe some capital cost, maybe to borrow or whatever, or maybe, you know, as, as, as we know, there is a cost for liquidity. And then plus that, you also have a blockchain cost, right? A mining cost. But let's say you have 1,000 people and for you to broadcast that transaction is $100. I mean, not you, the service provider, it costs $100 to miners to broadcast, but it's 1,000 people, you understand, you can divide for that amount of people, at least to cover the, the blockchain costs, and then you can charge something on top, right? Some basis point on the value of the, of the virtual Bitcoin. So the pricing will be more similar to payment processor, where you charge you know, a fee, a percentage fee on the, on the value that you, are, that you are transacting. Since you know the, the liquidity needs to be provided 
by the coordinator. So uh, there is a cost to that. And, and I think that the business model will be that similar, but no but other coordinator or other service provider, maybe they can charge you a subscription fee, maybe, right? So they subsidize maybe small transaction or I don't know, some tire volume. I think there, there is a lot of experimentation in terms of business model, but yes, you can definitely think of uh, uh, business point on, on every virtual Bitcoin created. Just, so they are kind of like banks uh, and, and, and then they go and can do it uh, between them. Interesting. Um, when like I, I know a lot of, uh, there's like Lightning, Fediman, there's Arc, there's Liquid, like there are a lot of uh, layer two solutions. You also told, told me before that do you think that they might be working together uh, and they might complement each other. Um, maybe can you give us a, a small overview of, of like the, the most promising layer two solutions that you see and how they could maybe also work together in the future and what use cases they, uh, they can give us? I did see, I mean, of course this is semantics, so it's very hard, but if you want to say that to be a real second layer, you need to have this unilateral, not unilateral exit, uh, capability. I really see Lightning and Arc, uh, and maybe, you know, Mercury layer and state chain. Of course, there are trade offs there, but I really see these two or three, uh, kind of real second layer or the other are basically other blockchain that have some bridging mechanism. And right now, uh, as, 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 you know, uh, from my knowledge, I think there is no trustless bridge. Uh, but even if tomorrow we get covenants and we can make proper trustless bridge, which means I deposit one Bitcoin and some address, and this address issue some rapid Bitcoin on the other chain, on the side chain. Uh, it's true, it's trustless, this process, if you trust the code and, and, and the stuff. But at the same time, it doesn't feel to me an part of the main protocol. You're just like moving your Bitcoin from one blockchain to another blockchain. So it's very clunky, right? So it's like, it's not really interoperability. It's just, you know, I'm moving Bitcoin to another derivative form of Bitcoin, but this doesn't feel an, an upgrade of the protocol like Lightning, which is an actual, uh, you know, not, broad, not yet broadcasted Bitcoin transaction and even ARC is a not yet broadcasted Bitcoin transaction. So I think these are really feels natural native second layer. The other like not yet uh, trustless, but even though they will have bridge that will allow go between rapid and real Bitcoin in a trustless way, they will feel a different separated uh, universe. No, there will be a different universe, a different blockchain, a different explorer. So it feels uh, a little bit uh, to me. Uh, that's how I see. But uh, in particular, I see Lightning very, very interesting because now going back, like where Lightning shines and where uh, potentially Arc doesn't. And I think when you have two entities that are capable of doing two things, running a server and so be online and uh, understand the topology of the network, understand how the liquidity should be deployed. These entities to me, doesn't sound my mother or, you know, normal plebs. It sounds to me banks, exchanges, um, you know, ARC service provider themselves. So I really see these entities already capable to run a channel. They create a channel between peers and they can settle between them. And it's very common in banks, you know, like if you think about the Swift network, right, or any other parallel, I really see lining more to that. I know that has been sold as the visa network of the consumer, but I don't, don't see that for like how it's been designed. But I really see incredible tool for entities that need to settle between each other multiple times. And they really need to go back and forth. And two banks, they go back and forth because if I pay another bank, you, you have another bank, my bank will basically pay the other bank, but the bank will need to pay back. And if, and if you substitute the banks to ARC service provider, that's true because maybe me and you, we are in the same ARC, but then you have another friend, which has another different ARC. And I think it's super simple where I can basically use my virtual Bitcoin to pay a lining invoice, all of this in an atomic trustless way. So I can pay a lining invoice and that lining invoice has been basically transformed at the end in a BTXO, in a virtual Bitcoin of the actual receiver in a different arc. So I really see lining as the lingua franca, you know, like the, the connective tissue between multiple layers and, and even centralize it or decentralize it. It doesn't matter if it's arc or is an exchange. I think lining shines in that use case. And yeah, arc really um, benefit from, from this. Multiple arc will benefit from having lining. 
So, I mean, to a certain extent, Lightning is already kind of the bridge between things you can really easily go from, I don't know, uh, some, some Lightning wallets to even like Bitcoin exchanges, uh, from a Bitcoin exchange to Bitcoin. Like Lightning is already, um, in a sense, uh, maybe not natively, but uh, maybe it could be better, but uh, um, in a sense, this this bridge. And you see Lightning kind of this um, street between those service providers who then can actually offer uh, the day-to-day -day transactions. Like the, the there's like an institution or like some sort of, <laughs> I don't like to use that word too much, but bank, uh, that uh, Lightning are uh, transacting with each other. And then there is an ARC service provider and there you can give you like two euros or like few sats for, for coffee. Um, that's an, that's an interesting, so like you see, um, basically, uh, lightning complementing arc and arc complementing lightning. Is there is there another one uh, you would say is is uh, important for that? At the moment, I think, and I mean, th I, I don't think this is a fault of, of of the ecosystem, but really, like I think after 2017, we really stopped researching new scaling solution. We just said, okay, we got lightning. And Lightning, if it doesn't work, the big blocker will, will tell us uh, we are not good. No? So I think everybody wanted to marry this idea, this, uh, you know, this idea that Lightning will fix everything. And I think for a lot of years, and I'm very convinced about this, people stopped trying to think about new, new thing and, and try to think, you know, dedicated protocol for dedicated use case, more like product oriented mentality. Right. And I think Arc has a, a lot of this, like, Uh, after four years of LSPs, Lightning wallets, and all the hard, you know, all the problems have been seen, I think Arc came to okay, thank you. Uh, we, we have done, you know, user research. We have done, you know, interesting, you know, capabilities. So now we can design a protocol for that specific use case. But Lightning is very hard uh, to work, and I think inbound liquidity is the main issue. There is no such thing in any other thing in the human. Uh, For, for, for end user, for retailers, like uh, liquidity management channels is something you need to explain, but, you know, it's very technical. It's very like uh, not for normal people. And the fact that, you know, I go around, I go back to the example, I orange peel someone and then I say, hey, download the Lightning Wallet, even non-custodial. But then if I need to send you one dollar, I can't because it doesn't have a channel, most likely. And the, the amount of channel need to be deducted from the amount I'm sending. So if I'm sending $1 for the first time to this guy, it will say, oh, what such a scam. I received 20 cents. Uh, where the 80 cents go, uh, went? And you need to explain, ah, there is inbound liquidity there is, and people lose you, right? And 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 I think that's uh, that's how I see. I really see for now Lightning Arc. And I, as I said, I think uh, together they can, you know, um, enhance uh, a, non a self-custodial, non-custodial, um, approach to using Bitcoin that doesn't require eating the blockchain all the time. Thank you. You already made it halfway through the video and I'm really, really grateful to have you here. Two things make this channel possible. You as a watcher and listener who keep supporting this channel. And another one is all the Bitcoin brands that I partner up with, like 21Bitcoin, who support me from the very start and where I personally buy my Bitcoin from. With Code Robin, you even get a discount when you buy Bitcoin with them. And now also Bitbox. Bitbox is the simplest and securest way to secure secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistics. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack, if you use code ROBIN, you get 5% off your order plus you support my channel. And now let's get back to the video. Mm, interesting. How, how much is, uh, uh, before that, um, does any of this and this, the future scaling solutions of, of uh, Bitcoin with Lightning, with Arc, with potentially other things um, require any updates on the main layer? Yeah, I think uh, Covenants is the big, uh, you know, the big thing people are, are talking about. And I think Covenants will, one, unlock new type of second layer that we don't even imagine right now. Uh, so I think the community understand the value of covenants and, and actually covenants were in Bitcoin from the day one. So it's not something, oh, new, shiny, new thing. It was already in Bitcoin, but then deactivated for many reasons, blah, blah, blah. Um, 
Arc as the beginning required covenants, but you know many researcher, in particular Ruben Sampson, you know proposed a scheme that will allow for you, which is the main problem for Arc that requires covenant is sending to you, Robin, and you are offline. You know, like this concept of a sync payment, right? So offline receiving. And at the beginning, the idea was okay, you need covenants for that. And but actually, you know, Ruben came with his own uh, new payment protocol which allow you actually to, even without any change to Bitcoin, to actually send you offline. And it just changed the approach on how the art protocol works, but uh, you are confident. And right now, you know, we release the two implementation, one for Bitcoin and one for Liquid. And Liquid is basically just a Bitcoin uh, sidechain that has covenants updated. So we can experiment, we can see, okay, this is the best form of art possible. If you get covenants to one on Bitcoin, it's here, you can test it. But then we are also, using what we can right now on Bitcoin with a different payment protocol, we can do, we can deploy on Bit, uh, Arc on Bitcoin right now. The thing is that even though we sold the offline receiving, there are huge trade-offs. And one, for example, you need to keep, uh, beside more interactivity, because as you imagine, since we don't have covenants, we do a lot of pre-signature between the peoples and it requires a lot of bandwidth. But assuming that that's not a problem, I think the other problem is like, I need as a, user, I need to keep a backup, a special backup, very similar to how Lightning works. And if I lose that backup, I will not be able to unilateral exit, which is the same on, on Lightning. The beauty here is like this backup, uh, you need to keep it only until the expiration of your B virtual Bitcoin, right? So it's a less, uh, so in, in Lightning, you need to keep forever. Uh, here, you can prune it, right? After, after one month, you know, after the expiration of your, of your virtual Bitcoin. And the other is to onboard the ARC if you get covenants, but this is also true for Lightning. We don't need to have a special wallet. You, you can just send to a normal Bitcoin address. For example, tomorrow we go to Binance. We don't need to convince Binance to integrate ARC like Lightning. We just say, hey, you just withdraw normal Bitcoin. And this Bitcoin address is actually an ARC uh, boarding address. And I think that's for me is very important if you want, really want to make it, you know, the standard protocol on how Bitcoin is transacted. Uh, we really need this uh, approach uh, way where we don't require every player in the space to integrate the special wallet to special wallet capabilities. And Lightning has been very problematic for them to integrate because they took four years because we had to, you know, understand a specific protocol. Instead, if they could just fund channels, just send it to a Bitcoin address, well, the, the adoption will be much better uh, from an enterprise, enterprise standpoint. And the other thing, the covenants makes the liquidity management for the coordinator much, much better. And also this unroll uh, three, which may be problematic because imagine there is 1 million people in this arc uh, and they need to go out, which means 1 million transaction. I mean, roughly, I'm just telling you the uh, figure need to be broadcasted, need to be published on the chain, which is pretty, you know, a congestion, uh, you know, a issue. Right. And covenants will allow you to unilateral exit using maybe fraud proofs. And with pro for, fraud proofs, uh, I can just exit by, by myself. I don't need to simple, just single transaction. And, or for example, we can allow, you know, as I said, we can allow the liquidity to be much better for the SP. So my point is that ARC is ready now. So we can deploy. We are working on it and uh, people will see, we'll use it very soon. We are working as we speak. But at the same time, we recognize that for a proper retail, you know, commerce oriented retail consumer mobile application, uh, I think covenants will be the, the best, right? So, or the best scenario for building su such type of application that is really self custodial and does really minimal dependency to any other people that needs to help him to, to have a wallet. Yeah, I mean, I hear, I think there was uh, at least like 10 guests already on that without me asking them, they made advertisement for governance. Uh, so I, I think, uh, there's more and more consent finding for, for that, uh, for that update. How, how likely do you, do you think it, it will happen on, or like, uh, and in what time frame? I mean, it's impossible to say <laughs> for sure, but what, what is your feeling? Yeah, it's very hard, especially in open source project first, but in particular in Bitcoin to uh, understand how, you know, things will change or will happen because you really need to have you know, full consensus, right? It's a distributed system. So you really need to make sure that there is no huge, you know, controversy between, you know, two or three or four faction. So 
But one thing is like, I think like regardless of the proposal, the specific current proposal, there is, I would say, consensus that that's the best, uh, you know, the, the next step. And if you look at Taproot, Taproot is the last software. Uh, Taproot is kind of a refactor, what we call in, uh, from an engineering perspective, we call it is a refactor of the scripting system. And it looks like a person from the future came back and made Taproot. And if you don't do covenants, it's basically useless. Yes, you make better Schnorr signature, you need better multisig, but we all understand that that was not necessary uh, or super important, like instead having very complex script, right? Or like maybe, I don't know, 12 or 100 condition. And without covenants, you cannot do much. So I think, yeah, covenants bond very well with Taproot. So I think it's natural, the natural next software. Um, I, I really cannot, don't know, but it sounds that people are talking now. So, and very actively, a couple of years, we will maybe be in a good shape. I think I'm, I'm totally chill. They can take 10 years. I'm okay. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think I'm, I'm, awful, I'm more, more, much more optimistic this year, to be honest, because of course, being at the edge, uh, doing covenant stuff in four years ago, two years ago, I wanted yesterday, you know, already covenants on Bitcoin, but of course I understand. And that's why I built a lot of stuff on liquid because there I could actually experiment with real money and real covenants and, uh, and go on production, take feedback from the user. So yeah, I'm not in a rush, uh, but yeah, I'm, I hope we, hopefully, hopefully in the, this decade. And I think, I mean, there, there's this one thing that Bitcoin has to be technically ready for like mass adoption and medium of exchange adoption, uh, that we actually can spend it every day with like really like a lot of people. And I think we have still work there. And I think, uh, Lightning Arc and all those, um, uh, people that are included in those ecosystems are doing an amazing job every day. Um, but at the same time, I also see that most people don't even want to spend their Bitcoin right now uh, because it's such an amazing store of value. Then most people live somewhere where there would be tax implications when they spend their Bitcoin. They don't want to be on the illegal side or they don't want to pay taxes. <laughs> um, they are like, fr from a lot of perspectives, we're just really early on. And I think we are now right now still in this store of value phase, but it's really important that we, before Bitcoin shoots up so much that a lot of people want to spend it and taxes are uh, uh, erased before that happens, that we actually have the technical things nailed down. And I like really using lightning on, on conferences, uh, even though I have to document that and then have to like talk with my tax consultant and everything, because there's actually tax implications, which, bothers me a lot, but <laughs> I, I, I want to do it the, the right way. The thing is when you, when you do all those things and you actually uh, transact it, uh, you, you contribute a little bit to, to the new technology and we, we're just really early on and, and we have to do that. And one question that was in my mind when, when you were talking uh, about that onion thing and uh, we can build s several layers on, on top of Bitcoin. I heard it in the beginning a lot. I don't hear it that much right now um, that all altcoins are basically obsolete because you could do it more securely um, and better on a Bitcoin second layer or third layer. Or if you cannot do that, it would be better in a actual centralized database. For example, I, I don't know why video games has to be <laughs> decentralized. Like, uh, like a video game money can be centralized. I have, like, I have no, uh, in, in that. So either the, the altcoin use case is on an actual centralized database because it's more efficient and more cost efficient. So it, it will be better over time, or it can actually be built on top of Bitcoin. What's, what's your opinion there? Yeah, no, the second, the second thing that you mentioned, like definitely most of centralizing uh, coin, think about stable coins or altcoin, but just think about a stable coin that are, at least have some usage or at least a, a real um, application is true. You can definitely do it on a database, but the best thing of blockchain is to scam regulators in the sense that um, the, the beauty of using, you know, whatever, you know, I don't know, Tether or USDC or whatever, I don't want to mention on any chain is that it seems decentralized so it, they can operate, right? So I think it's true from a, from a, you know, theoretical perspective, but I think people really care to not uh, be 
the money transmitter to not be the actual person that otherwise would be Liberty Reserve, right? So I can definitely do, um, you know, stablecoin much better with my database, but that's Liberty Reserve basically, and that's how it went. So these layers of blockchain insurance and so on divide, I, I think, the risk for the issuer and who is operating the blockchain, who's operating the wallet infrastructure. So I think this approach is like much more, I will not say transaction resistant, but resistant to, to attacks, to um, um, re potentially uh, regulatory attack. The, the other thing is like, which I, I believe and and I think having other assets on Bitcoin, on the layer one, on Bitcoin, not layer two, which that's another, another topic, but on layer one, having other assets on Bitcoin, I think can mess with the with the consensus or can in general can mess with the politics because it means that now you have an asset which is you know non not native is not Bitcoin anymore. You have a new asset that you it might have leverage to push for our fork or whatever. I don't know. I'm 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 not saying I want to say I'm scared of what I don't know, but it's well known that in the end why I need to use the Bitcoin blockchain, which is low um super slow, super expensive to translate an IOU in any way, maybe it's better to do a second layer for sure, because otherwise if you need to create an, yet another blockchain and yet another currency, that's another problem because you are competing with Bitcoin from a monetary perspective. But assuming you're doing a stable coin and you're not competing with Bitcoin, you don't need your own blockchain. You just need a ledger, which is as network effect good enough. And we assume Bitcoin has good network effect and all the exchange support it. The speculation there, if we do a simple second layer and we do assets on the second layer, then we can use the Bitcoin network effect to move also other assets. And, you know, this is not new, Colored Coin, RGB, Taro, or you name it, right? So personally, I think I will definitely, if I need to use a stable coin, I don't, I don't want to use it on Bitcoin main chain. I will use it on Liquid or any, or any other chain, but I will go on Liquid because I don't want to acquire a shit coin to pay for my gas fees, right? So I will just um, use it on liquid. There is Tether there, so I use it there. Uh, or maybe on Arc or maybe on Lightning. But again, I think issuing the asset on the main chain of Bitcoin is just uh, not so interesting and they potentially mess uh, with the economics of, of Bitcoin. So if we can keep the, the assets out, uh, far away from Bitcoin layer one, I'm, I'm happier. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I was really toxic uh, like a year ago in Bitcoin. <laughs> like I, I was really toxic against all the altcoins. I was really toxic against a lot of things that was not Bitcoin. And I think, um, I don't know, like I, I got really um, chilled now with Bitcoin in a sense if if Bitcoin is actually the sound money and actually the 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 solution to 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 the problem that we have with the monetary system, the 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 thing that we actually think it is, then it does not matter what other people do with it. It's also with the ETFs. I heard it a lot. Like oh, but now like order uh, executive order six oh one oh two will come now to Bitcoin and stuff like that. And I'm like, it's a possibility that it comes. Um, but gold survived it. And if Bitcoin is strong enough, Bitcoin will also survive it. So like if, if Bitcoin, uh, is, is strong enough uh, and is actually the sound money that we think it is. And I actually think it is that, um, that it could withstand also the, the, the weird things that can happen on top of, uh, Bitcoin that I'm not a fan of. Like I, I'm, I, I would like to use Bitcoin as money. And nothing else. Like I, I don't like weird things on top of the of the Bitcoin layer. Um, other people might like it. It's 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 okay for me. Uh, but th they should not be able to break Bitcoin. That, that, that's that's kind of my point. Uh, so like if if someone with with some weird thing on top of Bitcoin is able to break Bitcoin, then maybe Bitcoin was not that resilient in the to begin with. But I don't, I don't think that like, that was a, a, a weird monologue, but <laughs> my, no, no. My, 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 my point was, I think that Bitcoin is the most soundest money and uh, most robust network that we ever had, and we should protect it at all costs. Um, um, but the, the reason that it's so robust is the reason why I'm so uh, chilled about most of the things. <laughs> No, 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 makes totally, sense. and uh, and makes sense. And and to me, like, I I think if other people are using the Bitcoin blockchain for things that are not moving Bitcoin, 
is the fault is our fault in the sense that we are not using Bitcoin enough. As you said, no, there are many complications, tax implication, or it's not only scalability, it's not only cost, even if I give you the perfect scalability solution, but then people are not using because you know it's so volatile that you know why I need to use it unless maybe I receive Bitcoin as, as a as a salary. So I think there are many other concepts which is beyond technology that are not there yet in, in pieces to let you really leave out of Bitcoin. Because when we say money, yes, for sure, saving is a huge component of money because I want to save, but then at some point I need to spend it, right? So uh, otherwise it's like, um, it's, a, it, it's another other piece, which I agree is not there yet. There's not, uh, there is no rush to do that. But I think like if we really want to increase the monetary use case of Bitcoin, we need to make sure we can use it uh, to pay. We need to bring back commerce. And it's very funny to me, but I, I really say that early on, Bitcoin was much more used uh, for many other use cases. Remitted. People that don't even know about Bitcoin, don't even believe or understood what Bitcoin was, but for them was a cheaper Western Union, right? And they used that and there is no document to open a Bitcoin wallet. For them it was amazing. And people non-tech savvy, they were coming by Bitcoin. I think now Tether, took a lot of that use case, no? Like, of course, because you don't have the volatility in that and people understand $1, $1. And, and of course, a lot of that use case, but I really think that we should bring back commerce. And I think Bitcoin is a definitely great um, instrument, maybe not buying the coffee or in, in the real life store, but even starting just with digital commerce. I think that's a, a huge opportunity where we are just getting too complacent and we say, okay, who cares? We just hold and we don't use it. But actually I think, it makes sense for you to try to say, okay, maybe I will take half of my salary in BTC. So I'm, let's say I'm forced to use it, right? So, uh, yeah. So I think uh, we really need to increase the in the commerce use case. I would say. Yeah, I I would love to just use to price out them, right? To yeah. price out the JPEG yeah. if that was the, the, the be, be, because if if it's so cheap to put some random stuff on there, then, then, then we should use it more as money. I, you're absolutely right with that. Um, one last thing, uh, I want to, to, to mention because guests actually brought it up and, and one very popular guest also brought it up on my podcast, Jeff Booth, uh, is Fediment. Uh, and, uh, he said something, uh, with that it was very similar to you that, uh, um, the lightning is like the highway streets. Uh, and, uh, I think, uh, he said like super highway or something like that. Um, and then he sees like those cities and towns and he says like, see, sees like a fediment or uh, as those cities and towns. Um, how, how is a fediment is, is not the, the unilateral thing that you talked about. Uh, is that the key difference or, and, and why would you like prefer, um, um, arc above a fediment or maybe has fediment some just an other, another use case no i think it's much more similar um thinking about how it will look like when you replace arc with fediment so i think it's that that explanation makes a sense but again arc uh, is more expensive than fediment by nature because there's a liquidity cost that need to be paid for someone instead fediment is a database so it costs you a few dollars per month to keep a Fediment, you know, either, either Fediment or even Cashew, a single, doesn't matter. But you understand that when you are custodial, a lot, of, you cannot compare, you know, is Apple and Orange things you can really compare because when you are custodial, you have zero cost for doing anything. Your cost is the trade off, uh, sorry, is the trust trade off, right? So, and also how to explain to user that this is a trust and how you explain to regulator that you are not a money transmitter or whatever. So I think, um, I think in, they, they both have a place. And to me, as I said before, you know, even below a certain point, ARC becomes custodial because you cannot afford to pay your, your, your exit transaction. And I think for all those use cases, you know, very small micropayments, I think, you know, eCash, Fedmin are very good, for example, right? So, um, I don't know, maybe just, you know, a, an hotel system or a festival, you know, let's take an example. You do a festival. Why I need to do an art, even an art transaction? We can just create, you know, a simple, you know, it's a small village uh, and we just, you know, deposit our ARC Bitcoin at the, at the, at the counter and I get my cash, uh, you know, e-cash, uh, and then I using inside to pay, to pay, to pay things inside that festival. Then the festival will end in two, three days and then I will exit. And of course I'm coming to the festival and the festival has, a, has an incentive to not steal my money because he wants to sell me more beers and more stuff. So I think a lot of use cases 
are totally fine and 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 I think there will be a place for that and even I think running an arc service provider I think you need more people you need more entities and why not creating a fedimin to run an arc right to be a service provider so you can definitely have like your buddies you know investment bankers they all coordinate and they create a fedimin uh, to do that to provide liquidity so I think there are many other use cases so of course like as I said before, if we stop innovate, if we stop research, uh, we are stuck with lining and whatever less. And then now we again, we are again in the same problem. We need to stack things that are not designed for what we need to do, but just because they are available. So to me, it's like a kind of a defeat to say, no, okay, let's not innovate, let's not research. We, that's what we have, and just you know, stack uh, some trust layer all around. Um, so yeah, I think uh, again, uh, I, I would see eCash to announce. Um, you know, many other uh, situations where Bitcoin is used and where, you know, the trust trade-off is more than accepted. Um, so I think they also will cooperate, but it is very hard to compare. And uh, I don't believe people should, I mean, I don't believe we need to stop now researching. Maybe in 20 years, 40 years, if we figure out that the, the trust is the only way to scale Bitcoin, okay, then we can, uh, you know, have our white flag and, 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 and say defeat, but I'm more... I'm more optimistic, let's say. Let's, uh, let's try to, to, to be more adherent to the Bitcoin ethos and uh, how Bitcoin should work. Yeah, and that, I think that's, uh, that's the whole point. Like, the more people develop in the stuff, the better the chances that we come up with something that actually works in the end of the day. Because uh, no matter what layer solution, even uh, no matter what layer solution to Bitcoin, nothing has right now the mass use case. Because only a small, like only a very small percentage of people actually get Bitcoin in the world. And then from those, only a small percentage actually also work with those layer two. So like when we look at the whole world, we are still very, very early and very, very uh, small. We're not that early because we're 15 years in, but we are very, very small still. Um, so in that way, uh, everything that's developed now is for ex something really good. Even though maybe we come to, to the conclusion, oh, this is actually a bad thing, or this is, is this is the thing we always should have focused on, or something like that, but we we probably don't know yet. Like at least I don't know yet. <laughs> that's that's the thing. Yeah, perfect. And uh, let's come uh, closer to the end of the podcast. Um, there's one question before the the end routine questions. What are you most excited about in Bitcoin? Like, what are you looking forward in the next, like, one year, five years, 10 years, whatever? Um, what is something that you're like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that event or that thing happening or whatever you want to, to go there? I assume beside ARC, right? A bit <laughs> beside ARC, yeah. <laughs> no, I think um, I'm very interested in things like, I mean, if you just, but they are not that far away, like silent payments. For me, those things are, very interesting because it, it the, from it's one of those things that are like not making the UX worse for the user. They're actually improving the user experience of the user and also bringing you privacy. So on that side, I think uh, silent payments is uh, for me the most exciting things uh, so far. But uh, again, like assuming uh, Bitcoin with uh, you know a better Bitcoin script, which means you know covenants. I really think that you know that uh, we can really trying to think uh, in a more bold way to how to build a Bitcoin native economy, which means, you know, new kind of, you know, economic primitives, which now we are just, of course, comparing things with, you know, the fiat system, the fiat economic system, but how will look like, I don't know, lending, how will look like derivatives uh, based on a Bitcoin standard where, you know, you cannot print money. Uh, so you need to, you know, try to find other ways. And, but I think, you know, like beyond savings and commerce, there is a huge market and a huge need of this, you know, uh, financial products and financial primitives. So I really looking forward to, uh, I don't know, Bitcoin native, uh, stable coin, which means there is no fiat bank account in entire stock. They're just using Bitcoin collateral and the issuance and the, and the burn of this stable coin ideally, uh, is done, you know, directly on the Bitcoin blockchain. So I think I'm super excited about that. I work on this and this project called Fuji, Fuji money on, on liquid. And I really looking forward to that. Like I really think that that would be, a huge thing, you know, like also trying to bring native, native, you know, financial primitives also, also to Bitcoin. New things, new things that you know, uh, the current people don't even imagine. So yeah, really cool. 
Perfect. Um, then uh, we have two questions. The, the, to the end routine, the first question is always the same question, even though I changed it a little bit uh, the, the, la the, the last time in the podcast, the first time. Um, so the question is, what can we learn from you besides all things Bitcoin? Yeah, very, very good question. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, in general, I think, you know, also my, my experience, you know, I went also before starting working in the Bitcoin space, I also, you know, worked a lot in what you can call big tech and, and whatnot. And, and I think there you have really smart, smart people. And there is a barrier between those smart people that don't even believe on the premise of Bitcoin. They really believe in the, you know, in whatever is the status quo. And they are super smart engineers. And I think, yeah, I think one thing I try and keep trying with, you know, my, all my work is trying to bring that type of competency, uh, the type of uh, engineering attitudes also to Bitcoin, which is much more like, I would say, uh, freedom, let's say more EP style, which is totally I love it. And that's why I, I'm in Bitcoin, but also trying, I think what we try to do is like to bring that type of, you know, um, enterprise ready or in general, you know, trying to bring, you know, uh, the type of approach that, you know, made Amazon, Facebook, you know, multi-million dollar company, and also try to bring also this to, to Bitcoin and of course many challenges, but yeah, uh, I think that's, uh, that's the goal. Amazing. R really good one. I actually, uh, because we have to, we have, we have to get more, uh, serious sometimes. <laughs> it's like we, we, we are still a young industry, uh, but when you see the big conferences around Bitcoin, uh, like in America, Nashville, in Europe, the Bitcoin Prague conference, uh, things like that, then you see like, oh, there's an actual big industry uh, around and behind Bitcoin. And, and it's, it's good to see the, uh, the professionality of, of Bitcoin companies and Bitcoin in general is, is going up. And yeah, now with the ETFs entering, with, with publicly traded companies entering, with, with countries entering we will have we, we see we will see this anyways perfect then uh let's come to the end routine of our uh, podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who actually is the next guest and the question from the previous guest is a totally unrelated question to bitcoin uh it, but it's an interesting one what is a personal health habit which you know you should do but you don't uh going going bad early in bed early, but uh, you know, working with many time zone and you know, being maybe you uh, in the middle, you know, Central Europe time zone, but then you know, working a lot with Soviet America, I go bed late, maybe I stay too much with the screens, computers, you know, working in tech. So, yeah, definitely, I'm guilty of too much technology. So, so you're guilty of working too hard, <laughs> or or maybe too too addicted to technology, you know, because most of the time you can work even without a computer, but you are always connected too much online. So I think that's uh, that's definitely something I wish to improve. Perfect. Then, um, before I let you go, where can people find you? Uh, where can people ask you questions? Yeah, I'm I'm on Twitter. Uh, my nickname is Tiero. You can find me Tiero Tiero, or even on Telegram Tiero or GitHub. Tiero again. Uh, we have a website, rclubs.to, uh, like Torrent. Uh, so you can definitely, I suggest you to go there and subscribe uh, to the newsletter uh, where we are going to, you know, release more updates, what we are doing, what our arc is going. So definitely, you know, that's a, that's a good suggestion to, to stay in the loop. Perfect. Then uh, thank you, Marco, for, for joining us. Thank you. Uh, for everyone that is watching and listening for joining us. I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Thank you.